Uh, thank you so much for inviting me to present today. Um, I'm really honored to participate in this event. Um, and as, as Alicia said, um, has said earlier, you know, I'm a child neurologist and I really do love my job, um, which sometimes people question because child neurologists often are viewed as excellent diagnosticians who have few treatments to offer. And while this may have been true about 10 years ago, the landscape has really changed dramatically. And I'm gonna spend the next 10 to 12 minutes hopefully helping you understand why I love what I do so much by getting you excited about the fact that we've entered an era of really precision health with new therapeutic opportunities in autism and neurodevelopmental disorders. Dr. I'm Shefali, I'm sorry to interrupt. We can't see your slides. Oh, sorry, hang on. Sorry about that. Um, not you. Let's see. Is that working? That is. You just need to go to full screen. Sorry. There you go. Perfect. Thank you. Hey, sorry about that. I was wondering why I was looking a little funny. Okay. So I'm going to, um, yeah, spend the next 12 to 15 minutes really helping you understand why I love what I do, but by getting you excited about the fact that we've really entered this era of precision health with new therapeutic opportunities in neurodevelopmental disorders and autism. And I'll also share with you some of the challenges that we have to overcome to ensure that we can test these emerging therapies effectively. So what is precision health? Well, to quote Obama in his State of the Union address um, several years ago, when he introduced increased government funding for precision health initiatives, um, its goal is to deliver the right treatment to the right patient every time. I would add in neurodevelopmental disorders, we also have to really consider delivering treatments at the right time, early enough in development to exact lasting changes. And in other areas of child neurology, precision health has not simply been an elusive goal. In fact, the story of Spinraza, which some of you may have heard of, is one that completely changed our field. This was an antisense oligonucleotide treatment, so a genetically targeted treatment for a devastating neuromuscular disorder called SMA that often led to early death or at least immobility. And with, the treatment of with this treatment, children are now living actually healthy lives. So I want to be clear that I'm not equating SMA with autism or other neurodevelopmental disorders, but the story of a genetically targeted therapy completely reversing the course of a condition brings us hope and it reinforces the promise of precision health. So precision health and neurodevelopmental disorders is also actually informed by genetics and genetics have really provide us with two key opportunities. So first, through advances in clinical genetic testing, we've identified thousands of causative copy number variants and single gene disorders that cause neurodevelopmental disorders. And while individually rare, taken together, they do account for about 15 to 20% of the spectrum. So what's happened over the last decade or so is that families of individuals with these various rare disorders have formed patient advocacy groups, which we call PAGs. And they provide support and advocacy, uh, but they also have accelerated research and clinical care, especially around trials. Um, critical though are partnerships between PAGs and also between PAGs and researchers and clinicians. And actually several years ago, the ASF led by Alicia Halliday here um, sponsored a group called AGENDA, which stands for the Alliance for Genetic Etiologies in Neurodevelopmental Disorders and Autism. And AGENDA is tasked to do just that. So it convenes clinicians, researchers, PAG leaders and parents and caregivers to develop common strategies to improve research and clinical care for these syndromes, really with emphasis recently on clinical trial readiness. So in addition to identification of syndromes, um, from genetic studies, we've also gained some insight into the fact that although there's thousands of genes, they do converge on some common pathways that really fundamentally affect the way the brain is wired. And that these changes actually occur well before a clinical diagnosis of autism or other neurodevelopmental disorders is made. And so this insight actually has gained some, uh, has really um, uh, helped inform some of our biomarker strategies as I'll talk about in a couple minutes. So back to precision health. So as we identify these genetic causes and understand the common pathways underlying these conditions, we can develop both syndrome and mechanism specific treatments rather than testing a much more large heterogeneous group of neurodevelopmental disorders. And what's exciting is that's exactly what's happened, right? So just in the last few years, we have an explosion in clinical trials and potential therapeutics, particularly for specific sy syndromic forms of autism and neurodevelopmental disorders. So what's the catch? I've given you a lot of good news here, but for these therapies to be clinically useful, we first need to run rigorous clinical trials. 
So let's first remind ourselves, taking a step back as to what a trial entails, right? So in a trial, patients are randomly assigned to one of two groups. One group receives the treatment and the other group is deemed the control. And at the end of usually eight to 12 weeks, an outcome is measured and this outcome is usually predetermined. Um, the effectiveness of that treatment is measured by comparing the treatment group to the control group. And of course, you know, the um, treatment is considered successful if the treatment group shows significant improvements over the um, control group. So where are the challenges in neurodevelopmental disorders? Well, there's a few. So the first is that it's difficult to know if the drug has truly hit the target, especially if the target is um, in the brain, right? Um, we also really struggle with our standardized clinical outcome measures, which are often not really created to test skills in neurodevelopmental disabilities. And then lastly, access to trials is difficult. It's difficult to come to sites to engage in these studies, which can lead to skewed enrollment. So I'm going to tell you briefly how, as a field, we're addressing these issues. You know, I'm um, uh, going to try to not show you lots of data, but just give you some snippets to give you a sense of where we are in the field in these different areas. So how do we mitigate these challenges, right? So um, we first need mechanistic biomarkers that really help determine drug target engagement and might also help serve as putative outcome measures. We need meaningful, measurable, and really evidence-based clinical endpoints that are tested in the populations that we are trying to treat. And then lastly, we need to develop flexible creative protocols that maximize access and scalability. And these are topics that really were also introduced in the beautiful talks this morning. So starting with biomarkers. So what is a biomarker? Well, it's a characteristic that's objectively measured and it evaluates either a normal biological process or a pathogenic process or a response to treatment. So there's many methods that can test biomarkers in neurodevelopmental disorders, as you can imagine. Uh, an area of focus, not just in my lab, but in, in groups around the country and world is electroencephalography. So EEG is a beautiful tool because it's a direct assay of neural transmission and brain network or circuit function. Um, for example, I can show you a couple of examples. In our group, we've studied infants who are considered at higher likelihood of developing autism because they have an older sibling. And we've actually found patterns of altered connectivity as early as three months in infants who end up with an autism diagnosis later on in childhood. Um, and this pattern could actually serve as a robust biomarker of treatment response. Um, in a specific genetic syndrome called DUP15Q syndrome, which Sarah Spence mentioned earlier, highly penetrant for autism and intellectual disability, we've identified a robust EEG pattern of elevated oscillations in the beta band that distinguish these children from non-syndromic autism as well as typically developing children. And in fact, this EEG biomarker is being studied in an upcoming trial as a marker of drug target engagement. So as promising as these biomarker strategies are, you can imagine that the field is using a range of methods in collection, in collection and analysis, and that that range of methods can sometimes hamper replication and generalizability. There's also a huge range in the signal of these markers, right? So some of these findings are really subtle. They're not always as obvious as the one I showed you with DUP15Q. Um, we also struggle with small sample sizes that are often not replicated. And so to address these issues, we really need consortium level efforts. And we've been lucky to be a part of two such consortia that I'll highlight. One is the Autism Biomarkers Consortium for Clinical Trials, which has been tasked to really identify EEG and eye tracking biomarkers that could be used for trials in autism. This is a five site study with more than 200 children with autism. Um, we've also been collaborating with the Infant Brain Imaging Study, which is a, initially was an MRI-based study of more than 200 infants considered at familial risk for autism. And we've added EEG biomarkers to that project to be able to robustly define predictors of early atypical development, again, ideally to then be eventually used in early intervention trials. So moving on to the issue of endpoints, so this is still a really challenging and moving target. Right, so what are the core features of neurodevelopmental disabilities that we're trying to treat? And how do we measure them in a short period of time? So we're studying an inherently dynamic process of development, right? Kids are of different ages and abilities and our endpoints need to be sensitive to that. We also need endpoints that are meaningful to families, right? Such as quality of life or adaptive skills. And those also sometimes can be hard to gauge or measure. And you know, most importantly, many of our standardized measures of cognition or behavior, they struggle from things like floor effects or um, from the inability to capture really subtle skills that our um, children may show or have. 
We also really are confounded by the placebo effect, which really occurs when a caregiver or a clinician report may be inadvertently biased by knowing that a child is in a trial. And so we need measures that might need to be less biased, maybe more quantitative. And here, our partnerships with the PAGs, again, have been really critical. They've allowed us to collect across sites, across clinics, enough clinical and behavioral data from patients to start to really tackle these issues, right? To better understand how do these measures that we're interested in behave in these populations? What are the most meaningful measures for families? And again, agenda has been really critical to that process, as has some sort of more specific syndrome-specific networks like the 15Q clinical uh, research network of which we are a part. So I can't show you all our data. Again, I have to reframe myself as a researcher. I love showing data, but I'm gonna show you one snippet as an example, okay? So in do 15 q syndrome, which I mentioned before, you know, motor skills are really delayed and um, which is true in many of our genetic syndromes, in fact. And actually parents have reported it as a priority area of improvement because as motor skills improve, adaptive living and daily living skills improve as well. And so we've partnered with the patient advocacy group to test various standardized measures in this population. And when we use standardized measures like the caregiver report of the, um, based on the Vineland or a direct assessment using the Mullen scales of early learning, what we find is that children with Do15Q have significantly lower motor skills compared to children with non-syndromic autism. And often their scores are at the floor. And so to better really test motor skills, because this is an important area, a colleague of mine, Dr. Rajutha Wilson, who's at UCLA and also a child neurologist, actually collected quantitative gate mat data at one of the family conferences. So with this technology, the child walks across the mat and we can actually quantify the gate of the child. And based on that, what she found was that there were quantitative objective measurable differences in the gate of children with Do15Q compared to those with non-syndromic autism. So the advantage of this kind of measure is that it captures function more objectively, maybe with a little bit more granularity than our standardized measures. And in fact, this is exactly the type of measure that's now going to be used in an upcoming clinical trial for DUP15Q syndrome. Okay, so the last point that I brought up was this challenge around access. And we've talked a lot about access and inclusion in this um, set of talks today. But you know, it's really difficult, as all of you know, to be involved in studies that require in-person assessments, right? They require adequate time, financial resources, and frankly, a level of engagement that's really difficult when you have a child with special needs. So this leads to really skewed samples of families that have the resources to participate in our studies. So in fact, just this year, um, through a working group in our autism center that was really focused on improving equity, diversity, and inclusion, we actually conducted a self-examination. And this is an examination really of studies of mind that do require in-person participation. And these are studies that includes kids with genetic syndromes, um, infants in, early, um, in the early months of life who might be at higher likelihood of developing autism. So a range of studies. And what we found is that many of our, most of our participants come from high income areas as denoted by this red heat map with red being higher income. We also found that half of our families have household incomes over 100,000 and that almost half our families are highly educated with parents who have graduate degrees. And so we just need to be more creative, right? To address this problem of access and generalizability. So how does this come back to trials? Well, I'll give you one example of ways that innovation can really improve this, um, this goal. Um, and this comes from a behavioral intervention clinical trial called JETS. It's for a genetic syndrome called tuberous sclerosis that's highly penetrant for autism. So we've conducted studies for almost a decade in collaboration with Boston Children's Hospital. And we found that in TSC, autism signs emerge as early as nine months of age. And so in that setting, we actually designed a clinical trial in collaboration with Dr. Connie Kasari at UCLA using her parent-based med uh, mediated intervention called JASPER. And it's been shown to improve social communication skills in early childhood. So this was the first randomized controlled trial for behavioral intervention in TSC. And it required families to come to the clinic once a week for intervention. So the trial received tremendous amounts of attention and excitement. We were all just incredibly thrilled to launch this program. And in the first year, this was our enrollment map with the yellow dots denoting the number of families enrolled. When we queried families about why they weren't enrolling, they all said it just was too difficult to come to UCLA or Boston. And one family even said, if virtual ever becomes an option, we'd be interested. And so that's what we did. We went back to the drawing board and with Dr. Kasari's team, and the support of the TS Alliance and NIH, we completely redesigned the study. 
So now families come to the lab once just to receive an iPad and learn a bit about the Jasper protocol. And then they go home and they practice Jasper with their child during the week. Once a week, they upload their practice video and it gets reviewed with an interventionist and then feedback is given over Zoom. And we also send text messages to families to check in with them and we collect all of our assessments also remotely. So with that change, within six months, this was the change in our enrollment map. Now this isn't perfect, right? Parents still need access to the internet. They need to have still the time um, and ability to participate in these check-ins and the intervention. But it taught us that having some creativity around remote delivery really can improve our access and clinical representativeness of our populations. So I'm gonna end with just a quick thought in, our, in this COVID era, era in which we all have been living for over a year now. Um, Dr. John Constantino and some of his colleagues who are leaders in our field wrote, a, I thought, a really moving um, letter to the editor in the American Journal of Psychiatry that really reminded us of the challenge that our families of children with neurodevelopmental disorders are facing during COVID, largely due to the necessary mitigation efforts, right? So they're profoundly affected by loss of services, limited access to health care, um, especially when they have complex needs, and loss of important interventional and social outlets. We wanted to better understand the experience of families, particularly with these genetic forms of neurodevelopmental disabilities. And so we conducted the survey called Caring Through COVID, which was a national survey uh, that was distributed, again, mostly by patient advocacy groups. Um, and here are some of our results. So we actually surveyed more than 600 families across the whole US. And really what we found, not surprisingly, was that many of our families had lost access to service and care. Uh, you know, with almost a third losing access to all of their services. But quite importantly, and really to highlight it in this presentation, most families stated that continued access to trials was a priority. And so I think it's incumbent on us as clinicians and researchers to find ways to flexibly deliver care and access to research for these families, even if it means altering gold standard protocols. We have to create a new gold standard, right? One that allows for inclusion and meets the needs of our families. So I'll end, circle back to this concept of precision health. So it's a really exciting time with a lot for us to learn and innovate. But as we develop these treatments, we need to not only think about the right timing, we also need to create an infrastructure for rigorous trials that have evidence-based biomarkers and endpoints. And we need to ensure that these trials can run safely and accessibly to really maximize our chance for meaningfully having an impact on the well-being of our patients. And so with that, I will stop um, and thank, thank our families um, first and foremost. Thank you to ASF, Alicia in particular, who's like a partner in crime for a lot of the work that I talked about. Um, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you so much. That was amazing. And it really encompasses, it really answered a lot of questions, but also um, there are some things that I think families still want to know. Um, one of them is, you know, we're, we're understanding more and more about these individual gene um, therapies or therapies for individual genetic disorders. How can they be used to help not just each other, since you mentioned that a lot of these genes affect common pathways and brain development, but cases of autism in which there's no known genetic cause or no known genetic marker? No, it's a great question. And I think that the trials are starting in the specific syndromes because it is a more well-identified, understood group. But you know, what we think is that even in cases of autism where there's not a single gene genetic cause, that still the pathways are similar, right? That we're still seeing that the effect is on, again, brain network function or um, you know, excitatory inhibitory neurotransmission. And so some of these, especially some of these drugs that are affecting those kinds of pathways absolutely could be effective in the broader autism population or at least in subsets. And actually I would say that's where kind of the biomarker work can be very informative because it might be that some of these biomarkers are reflecting some of those pathways and that we could even select patients for trial based on certain biomarker properties, right? So not, you know, we don't have to select just based on a genetic cause. We can select based on biology or based on other meaningful subgroups uh, that might respond well to certain kinds of therapeutics. Um, you also mentioned study recruitment at family meetings and you had that great picture of the little girl on the, on the gate, gate mm -hmm. slide. Um, Typically, what's the percentage of families that will participate in 
um, a in 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 a research study at a family meeting? Oh, at a family meeting, we had incredible enthusiasm about participating. And in fact, you know, the, that those data I showed, we actually set up shop. We had about five hotel rooms in a row set up to do behavioral assessments and EEG and, you know, um, parent questionnaires and all sorts of things. And we actually couldn't accommodate everyone that needed to or wanted to be tested. You know, I think one of the advantages of going to a family meeting is that we are, you know, of course, like, you know, alleviating the burden of having to travel to a and so we have found that parents are very enthusiastic about that. You know, I'll say that we have to balance that with also just, you know, respecting parents for their time and wanting them to be able to enjoy these meetings um, for what they are, which is a chance to network with families and learn from clinicians and researchers, right? So we don't want to turn the entire family meeting into a research study. Um, but I think it's a nice opportunity, you know, to take advantage of the fact that everyone is there and together. One last question. Um, so as a clinician, when or if, and I know you may not, but if, if someone, if the genetic counselor identifies a genetic mutation associated with autism, do you go so far as to say that that mutation is the cause of autism, of that autism? Um, if so we, what's sorry, the terminology the they use? Was if, you, if we find a mutation that is... Yeah, if you find a mutation, if a family presents to you with say a particular genetic mutation that's associated with autism and you mentioned Duke 15, um, would, do you go so far as to say it is the cause of that autism? It depends on what the mutation or variant is. Um, there are some genetic you know, conditions like Duke 15 q where absolutely we can say this is the cause, right? Sometimes we still find rare variants or rare mutations about which we know less and we're not entirely sure. Um, and so that's where, you know, we can work with our genetics colleagues and really look at things like family history, whether the mutation is passed down from a parent or not. There's, you know, there's various ways to determine if the, um, you know, mutation or variant is definitely pathogenic. Uh, but in many cases now, and I'll say, you know, 10 years ago or 15 years ago when I was in training, most of our genetic reports said variant of unknown significance, VUS, we, what, we weren't sure if they were causative. And now that's changed in most of these mutations and variants, um, we actually understand the underlying you know, pathophysiology and can say that, yeah, it's most likely causative.